I want to tell you about someone. I'm going to call him Ravi Nanda. I'm changing his name to protect his safety. Ravi's from a community of herds people in Gujarat on the western coast of India, same place my own family comes from. When Ravi was 10 years old, his entire community was forced to move because a multinational corporation constructed a manufacturing facility on a land where they lived. Then, 20 years later, the same company built a cement factory 100 meters from where they live now. India's got strong environmental regulations on paper, but this company has violated many of them. Dust from that factory covers Ravi's mustache and everything he wears. I spent just two days in this place, and I coughed for a week. Ravi says that if people or animals eat anything that grows in his village or drink the water, they get sick. He says children now walk long distances with the cattle and buffalo to find uncontaminated grazing land. He says many of those kids have dropped out of school, including three of his own. Ruby has appealed to this company for years. He said, I've written so many letters, my family could cremate me with them. They wouldn't need to buy any wood. He said the company ignored every one of those letters. And so in 2013, Ravi Nanda decided to use the last means of protest he thought he had left. He walked to the gates of that factory with a bucket of petrol in his hands, intending to set himself on fire. Ravi is not alone in his desperation. The UN estimates that worldwide, four billion people live without basic access to justice. These people face grave threats to their livelihoods, their dignity, their safety. There are almost always laws on the books that would protect these people, but they've often never heard of those laws. And the systems that are supposed to enforce those laws are corrupt or broken or both. We have been living with a global epidemic of injustice, but we have been choosing to ignore it. Right now, in Sierra Leone, in Cambodia, in Ethiopia, farmers are being cajoled into putting their thumbprints on 50-year lease agreements, signing away all the land they've ever known for a pittance without anybody even explaining the terms. Right now, in the United States, where I live right now, in India, in Slovenia, people like Ravi are raising their children in the shadow of factories or mines that are poisoning their air and their water. There are environmental laws that would protect these people, but many have never seen those laws, let alone having a shot at enforcing them. The world seems to have decided that's OK. What would it take to change that? Law is supposed to be the language we use to translate our dreams about justice into living institutions that hold us together. Law is supposed to be the difference between a society ruled by the most powerful and one that honors the dignity of everyone, strong or weak. That's why I told my grandmother 20 years ago that I wanted to go to law school. Grandma didn't pause. She didn't skip a beat. She said to me, lawyer is liar, <laughs> which was discouraging. <laughs> but grandma's right in some way. Something about law and lawyers has gone wrong. We lawyers are usually expensive, first of all. And we tend to focus on formal court channels that are impractical for many of the problems people face. Worse, our profession has shrouded law in a cloak of complexity. Laws like riot gear on a police officer it's impenetrable and intimidating, and it's hard to tell there's something human underneath. If we're going to make justice a reality for everyone, we need to turn law from an abstraction or a threat into something that every single person can understand, use, and shape. We lawyers are crucial in that fight, no doubt, but we can't leave it to lawyers alone. In healthcare, for example, we don't just rely 
on doctors to serve patients. We have nurses and midwives and community health workers. The same should be true of justice. Community legal workers, sometimes they're called barefoot lawyers, or community paralegals, can be a bridge. These paralegals are from the communities they serve. They demystify law, break it down into simple terms, and then they help people look for a solution. They don't focus on the courts alone. They look everywhere, ministry departments, an ombudsman's office, local government. <clears throat> Lawyers have this thing they sometimes say to their clients, I don't know if anybody here has said this, I'll handle it for you. I've got you. Paralegals have a different message. Not I'm going to solve it for you, but we're going to solve it together. And in the process, we're both going to grow. Community paralegals saved my own relationship to law. After a year in law school, I almost dropped out. I was thinking maybe I should have listened to my grandmother. It was when I started working with paralegals in Sierra Leone in 2003 that I began feeling hopeful about law again. And I have been obsessed ever since. Let me give you one more example. Um, or let me actually, before I do that, let me come back to Ravi. 2013, he did reach the gates of that factory with a bucket of petrol in his hands. But he was arrested before he could follow through. He didn't have to spend long in jail, but he felt completely defeated. Then, two years later, he met someone. I'm going to call him Kush. Kush is part of a team of community paralegals that works for environmental justice on the Gujarat coast. Kush explained to Ravi that there was law on his side. Kush translated into Gujarati something that Ravi had never seen. It's called the consent to operate. It's issued by the Gujarat state government, and it allows the factory to run only if it complies with specific conditions. So together, they compared the legal requirements with reality. They collected some evidence, and they drafted an application, not to the courts, but to two administrative institutions, the Pollution Control Board and the District Administration. <clears throat> Those applications started turning the creaky wheels of enforcement. A pollution officer came for a site inspection. And after that, the company started running an air filtration system it was supposed to have been using all along. It also started covering the 100 trucks that come and go from this plant every day. Those two measures reduced the air pollution considerably. The case is far from over, but learning and using law gave Ravi hope. There are people like Kush walking alongside people like Ravi in many places. I started a group called Namati. Namati helps convene a global network dedicated to legal empowerment. Altogether, we are over a 1,000 organizations. <clears throat> Collectively, we deploy tens of thousands of paralegals. Let me give you another example. This is Khadija Hamsa. She is one of five million people in Kenya who faces a discriminatory vetting process when trying to obtain a national ID card. It is like the Jim Crow South in the United States. If you're from a certain set of tribes, most of them Muslim, you get sent to a different line. Without an ID, you can't apply for a job. You can't get a bank loan. You can't enroll in university. You are excluded from society. Khadija tried off and on to get an ID for eight years without success. Then she met someone named Hassan Kasim a paralegal working in her community. Hassan explained to Khadija how vetting works. He helped her gather the documents she needed, helped prep her to go before that vetting committee. Finally, she managed to get an ID with Hassan's help. First thing she did with it was use it to apply for birth certificates for her children, which they need in order to go to school. In the United States, among many, many other problems. We have a housing crisis. In many cities, 90% of the landlords in housing court have attorneys, while 90% of the tenants do not. 
in New York, a new crew of paralegals, they're called access to justice navigators, helps people to understand housing law and to advocate for themselves. Normally in New York, one in nine of the tenants brought to housing court gets evicted. Researchers took a look at 150 cases in which people had help from these paralegals and they found no evictions at all, not one. A little bit of legal empowerment can go a long way. I see the beginnings of a real movement, but we are nowhere near what's necessary, not yet. In most countries around the world, governments do not provide a single dollar of support to paralegals like Hassan or Kush. Most governments don't even recognize the role paralegals play or protect paralegals from harm. I also don't want to give you the impression that paralegals and their clients win every time. Not at all. That cement factory behind Ravi's village, it's been turning off the air filtration system at night when it's least likely to get caught. Running that filter costs money. Ravi WhatsApps photos of the polluted night sky. This is one he sent to Kush in May. Ravi says the air is still unbreathable. At one point this year, Ravi went on hunger strike. Kush was frustrated. He said, we can win if we use the law. Ravi said, I believe in the law. I do. But it's not getting us far enough. Whether it's India, Kenya, the United States, or anywhere else, trying to squeeze justice out of broken systems is like Ravi's case. Hope and despair are neck and neck. And so not only do we urgently need to support and protect the role of barefoot lawyers around the world, we also need to change the systems themselves. Every case a paralegal takes on is a story about how a system is working in practice. When you put those stories together, it gives you a detailed portrait of the system as a whole. People can use that information to demand improvements to laws and policies. This is a, uh, let me give you a couple examples. In, um, in, in India, paralegals and clients are drawing on their case experience to propose smarter regulations for the hand handling of minerals. In Kenya, paralegals and clients are using data from thousands of cases across the country to argue that vetting is unconstitutional. This is a different way of approaching reform. This is not a consultant flying into Myanmar with a template he's gonna cut and paste from Macedonia. And this is not an angry tweet. This is about growing reforms from the experience of ordinary people trying to make the rules and systems work. This transformation in the relationship between people and law is the right thing to do. It is also essential for overcoming all of the other great challenges of our times. We are not going to avoid environmental collapse if the people most affected by pollution don't have a say in what happens to the land and the water. We are not going to succeed in reducing poverty or expanding opportunity if poor people can't exercise their basic rights. And we won't, I believe, Michael, we won't overcome the despair that authoritarian politicians prey upon if our systems stay rigged. I, um, I called Ravi before coming here to ask permission to share his story. I asked if there was any message he wanted to give people. Ravi said yes. He said, Jagrutao, wake up. Daruna joye. Don't be afraid. Kagariyati laro, fight with paper. By that, I think he means fight using law rather than guns. Ajne kadaj ek varasmane, panch varasmane, par nyay malo. Maybe not today, maybe not this year, maybe not in five years, but find justice. If this guy, whose entire community is being poisoned every single day, who was ready to take his own life, if he is not giving up on seeking justice, then the world can't give up either. 
Ultimately, what Ravi calls fighting with paper is about forging a deeper version of democracy in which we, the people, we don't just cast ballots every few years. We take part daily in the rules and institutions that hold us together, in which everyone, even the least powerful, can know law, use law, and shape law. Making that happen, winning that fight, requires all of us. Thank you. Thank you, guys.